Sasha oh. Luis for the a very kind introduction and also thank you Grace for organizing uh, this uh, click room and it's a great honor to uh, share my uh, latest research with you and as Luis said uh, I recently launched a lab called Social Infrastructure for Equity and Wellbeing in the University of Hong Kong. So we have uh, three major emphasis in uh, this lab. One is to look at housing and the other one is um, education as well as healthcare. So uh, in this lab, we have uh, some internal members as well as four members located in different parts of the world. So we're trying to uh, bring in different methodologies and data sources to understand uh, neighborhood change, housing development, and their linkages with education and healthcare and so on and so forth. So I have a long-term in research interest in enclave um, urbanism as well as uh, neighborhood and housing development in China. So today I will uh, give a very brief overview on uh, enclave urbanism in China and then I will move on to two recent uh, research I conducted with my co-authors. One is on uh, a very uh, peculiar form of migrant enclaves in one of the most successful uh, economic uh, zone in China, located in Suzhou. And the other one is an uh, ongoing project uh, with my colleagues in Cambridge University, who is actually joining us in uh, the seminar today. Uh, we to examine the uh, changing perceptions towards uh, gated community and enclave living in a, uh, the biggest Chinese city, Beijing, uh, during uh, the two waves of uh, COVID-19. So first of all, um, enclave urbanism is a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, in this research, I try to define enclave in its broadest uh, sense, uh, which not only include residential neighborhood, but also office tower, exclusive shopping mall, and so on and so forth as long as um, it's an enclosed urban setting or a special unit, uh, we can consider that as a enclaves, which are featuring a monocultural and mono uh, function, uh, homogeneous inside and segregated uh, from outside with uh, visible or non-visible boundaries. So uh, in, a, in the uh, academia, there are a lot of uh, criticism towards um, enclave urbanism because of um, they are generating and exhibiting uh, social segregation and social inequalities. They are also being uh, criticized for um, squeezing or um, encroaching the public space and so on and so forth. So scholars trying to understand um, the causes and the evolving forms of enclaves uh, from different perspectives by linking um, urban forms with political uh, economy, with institutions and social relations. So uh, from a political economy approach, uh, people tend to understand uh, the different urban forms uh, associated with uh, different modes of production and uh, a reflection and many presentation of social economic relations at the spatial scale. So, um, so as, a, as I said, enclave urbanism has becoming a hallmark for the post-industrial uh, society or the network society because of the refined uh, division of labor in the society have led to the increased uh, function, functional specialization. Uh, in the city. Se cities are separated into different functional zones or different residential uh, spaces for different uh, people of uh, uh, various uh, socioeconomic uh, status. And from a new institutional economics point of view, uh, enclave living, especially gated community, is also considered as um, an efficient form of housing production as well as uh, service provision, which can provide tailor-made uh, housing and services to people who can afford it, right? And the government also um, kind of support this kind of efficient uh, housing provision in order to offload their responsibility in providing uh, social services and public services uh, to uh, the citizens. And if we uh, see enclave urbanism from a uh, social cultural perspective, uh, we can um, 
we can uh, say that it's a reflection of people's um, uh, increasing fear from uh, exposure to uh, the enhanced um, risk and threat uh, in the public space. So they tend to retreat from public space in order to protect their privacy as well as uh, security. So uh, what about China? So in China, um, uh, I have published a paper a few years back in 2013 to understand uh, the evolving enclave urbanism in China. And currently in, uh, in the country, there were over 80 or even 90% of newly constructed houses are actually gated or they can categorize as gated community. And apart from this newly uh, introduced uh, form of residential estates, uh, people, Chinese people uh, used to live in different types of enclaves as well, including uh, the so-called Danwei Kampa or work unit Kampa, uh, the residential estates provided by state-owned enterprises or government organizations. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, a lot of um, rural migrants are thrown in into the city and they tend to live in uh, migrant enclaves, mainly in the form of urban villages. So um, you may wonder, uh, given that um, enclave urbanism is so uh, prevalent in China, why uh, it did not create a problem of social segregation or uh, why people are not having a problem with that? So I'm trying to understand uh, this uh, phenomenon uh, from two aspects. One is to uh, see the rise of enclave urbanism through a historical perspective uh, to look into its historical continuity. First of all, uh, enclave living has a very long um, history in China. It's nothing new, uh, which can be traced back to the history of uh, war city. In, uh, in ancient China to uh, the more recent history of uh, Danwei Kampa uh, developed during the socialist period to the prevailing gated community and enclave and, and uh, migrant enclaves in contemporary Chinese cities. So these uh, different forms of enclaves are overlaying uh, in the contemporary city and creating a very uh, complex urban fabric and urban structure dominating uh, the contemporary Chinese city. Uh, another aspect to understand uh, the rising enclave urbanism is to uh, understand it through um, the socially constructed rationality imposed uh, by the state. So as you know that in China, we have a long uh, tradition of um, or philosophy of um, Confucianism and uh, the influence of collectivism uh, has been uh, emphasized during the socialist uh, period, as well as a very strong social control that has been uh, long imposed uh, by different levels of uh, government. So uh, this is another key explanation for the rationalization of uh, enclave living in uh, Chinese cities. But this has created a lot of uh, controversies as well as um, the discrepancies between um, the, um, the government narratives as well as um, what we have, what we can observe uh, in reality. One thing is uh, the, the effectiveness of uh, urban governance or neighborhood governance. So um, on the one hand, uh, after the market reform, uh, municipal government trying to uh, offload their responsibility of providing public resources and uh, public services by uh, redefining the boundaries of uh, home ownership as well as the managing uh, management um, responsibility to residential neighborhood. Uh, so uh, they don't have to provide um, public services uh, to the extent that uh, those neighborhoods can uh, take care of themselves uh, by introducing uh, commercial management companies services, uh, as well as developing uh, gated communities. But if uh, we are um, seeing uh, the effect of uh, neighborhood governance and urban governance uh, from a municipal uh, 
scale, we can see there is a huge waste and uh, repeated construction and um, exclusive provision of services, which are only can be enjoyed by residents within uh, the gated community, but uh, not being uh, accessed by uh, outsiders. So this has, uh, in fact, created uh, inefficiency at a, a municipal level. Um, on the other hand, if we try to understand um, the rationale behind um, the rising enclave urbanism in China, uh, we can see that uh, the government is trying to promote um, enclave living by arguing that um, the physical boundaries did not really stop people from uh, very intense social interaction during their daily life. Uh, so some people even claim that uh, there are a stronger interdependency and linkages, social interactions between uh, different social groups compared to uh, the socialist period or uh, the period before the socialist revolution. So this is one argument, but uh, on the flip side, uh, we can also see uh, this um, prevalence of enclave living in fact has concealed inequality that hidden behind the gates and walls of um, enclave uh, living. Uh, for instance, uh, the access to um, public services, education, green space, and, and other types of um, uh, services, which used to be uh, public goods, provided by uh, the municipal government now has been privatized or turned into a club goods that exclusively enjoyed by uh, the homeowners or the residents. So these are the ongoing debates in uh, urban China, uh, which I have tried to provide um, overview uh, in my previous uh, publication. So in recent years, I'm trying to extend uh, my um, study along uh, two dimensions uh, to extend the scholarship of enclave urbanism. One is to, um, to explore more different uh, diverse forms of enclaves that uh, are not necessarily internally homogeneous. Although at the beginning I do uh, mention that uh, by definition, enclaves should be internally homogeneous, uh, but externally uh, heterogeneous. But recently we discovered a very in, uh, intricate form of um, enclave um, living for uh, migrants in a special economic form, which I will um, further explain in a few minutes. Uh, the other um, dimension I'm trying to explore is to understand people's changing perceptions and mentalities uh, in uh, enclave living by uh, looking at uh, how uh, the housing crisis and people's uh, willingness to buy uh, in uh, gated community has uh, been changed during uncertain times, especially during uh, the pandemic. Okay, so the first story is about a um, special economic zone located in uh, one of the most uh, developed region in China, uh, which is Suzhou, uh, not far away from Shanghai. So this is a co-author paper with my colleague, Dr. Chang, uh, who is uh, living and working inside uh, this uh, China, uh, Singapore Suzhou Industrial Park. So a lot of uh, improved materials actually coming from her. Um, so this, in this paper, we uh, try to understand uh, this uh, very, um, intriguing phenomenon uh, we call nested enclaves uh, in this uh, industrial park by drawing on uh, two streams of literature. One is uh, the conceptualization of housing regime. The other one is enclave urbanism in China, which I just briefly introduced. So in this research, we um, present some empirical evidence of uh, a hybrid housing regime in this uh, SIP, this uh, industrial park, uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, the low skill migrants uh, housing choices and uh, the um, very special uh, migrant enclaves that they're living in. This is a map showing uh, the outline of uh, the special uh, economic zone uh, with uh, the core zone in the middle 
The Kozong is where the offices, factories, and some high and commercial housing are located. And you can also see there are several different types of housing, including public rental housing. But this public rental housing is very different from uh, what we conventionally um, perceive. These are, in fact, a very high end public housing only provided for uh, those so called talents, talents who are usually the high skilled workers or uh, the professionals uh, who are working inside this uh, economic zone. And we also have some re um, resettlement housing uh, for uh, the local farmers as well, because this uh, park, this industrial park used to be farmlands owned by the farmers. So after uh, the construction of this ex um, special economic zone, uh, all the land has been expropriated from uh, the village collective and converted into urban areas. So there are uh, four major social groups within uh, this SIP. One is uh, the majority of them are local Hukou holders. Some are um, who are originally from Suzhou and some are migrated from other places, but all of them have obtained uh, the local household registration, what we call Hukou in Chinese. So they are mainly the middle-class homeowners who are living in gated community housing these days. And apart from that, there are uh, more than 18,000 foreign populations. Uh, they are also the talents that uh, the special zone trying to attract uh, from different countries who are high skill, uh, who are managerials or professionals. So they were provided the so-called talent housing, also public uh, rental housing at a heavily discount rate. Uh, um, and recently the Sudo government actually introduced a new policy to reserve about 60% of uh, the newly constructed commodity housing for those talents. So as you can see, they are enjoying a very uh, good housing conditions and, and also at a very uh, low price. So apart from these two groups, uh, there is a third group called uh, landless farmers. As I mentioned, their land has been expropriated by uh, the local government to construct this uh, special economic zone and they were rehoused, they were resettled in the so-called resettlement housing estates, also in the form of gated communities, but of uh, much lower quality. Uh, but there is no housing provision for the low skilled migrant workers at all. Uh, neither the local government nor the employers would provide housing for them. So most of them have very limited choice. They have to living in the subdivided housing uh, inside the reset resettlement housing issues for the landless farmers. So overall, we can observe uh, a hybrid uh, housing regime. For instance, uh, for the landless farmers, they are governed by um, a similarly social democratic regime because they were provided um, very spacious um, resettlement housing uh, to compensate for their loss of farmland. But if you compare the uh, housing value for the resettlement housing and the land value that has generated after the development of uh, the special economic zone, you can see there is in fact a hidden uh, logic of new liberalism behind uh, this development. And secondly, for uh, those people who are working in the SIP, including uh, middle-class homeowners and foreign talents, as well as the low skilled migrants, uh, they are uh, the housing regime, the housing provision actually follow a uh, productivist uh, regime, which means the housing conditions or housing provisions is closely associated with uh, their productivity or their, the level of their skills. So uh, this, uh, these are some pictures showing uh, the appearance of different types of housing. The one on the top, are the resettlement housing for migrants. Um, they are also in the form of gated community, but uh, in a, a very massive scale. And uh, on the left, uh, lower corner on the left are the migrant workers 
who are commuting between uh, the resettlement housing for landless families and their factories. And this uh, free shuttle bus services actually play a very important role by uh, linking their accommodation with uh, the workplace. So I will further explain in a few minutes. So without the provision of uh, free shuttle bus, um, uh, the, the migrant workers would not be able to um, conveniently accommodated within uh, the residential, uh, the uh, resettlement housing enclaves because they are located quite uh, further away from the factories uh, inside the core zone. Remember uh, the map I showed you earlier. And on the right, these are the uh, upscale commodity uh, housing as well as uh, the talent housing provided by for the high skilled workers and the managerials and the professionals. So um, as I mentioned, there is some special um, emphasis on uh, the migrant workers housing choices and how uh, the housing choice has affected their uh, precarity. Uh, so uh, there are three major actors who are collectively contributed to uh, the formation of the so-called nested enclaves within the resettlement housing. The first uh, important uh, stakeholder is the local state. As I said, they tend not to provide any housing for the low-skilled workers uh, because many of them actually working on a very um, unstable um, conditions. Uh, they, they only have a temporary contract. Some even don't have a contract at all. So uh, according to this productivist uh, regime, um, they are of uh, very low um, productivity and low skill. So they don't deserve uh, a housing provision in the eyes of the local state. But um, although the local state do realize that there is already uh, an informal rental housing is emerging within the resettlement housing East days, uh, they, they tend to keep a blind eye to this informal rental housing, uh, which involves subdivided housing and, and some um, safety risk uh, associated with the subdivided housing as well. But uh, because they are fully aware of that uh, the migrants do not have other choices. So they tend to tolerate uh, the, the development of informal housing. Uh, on the contrary, they also, um, provide some indirect or passive uh, subsidies uh, to support this housing arrangement. For instance, uh, they would uh, provide a renovation or upgrading to the sewage, to the infrastructure in order to accommodate uh, the enlarged population within the resettlement housing. Uh, this is uh, the role played by the local state. And secondly, uh, the employers, uh, many of them are actually transnational uh, companies. Uh, again, they, they do not provide accommodation for the low skilled workers at all, uh, but they do provide free shuttle services. Uh, on the surface, it, it seems those employers are um, providing um, very generous uh, services without charging the fee for shuttle bus, uh, shuttle bus uh, for a daily uh, commuting for the uh, migrant workers. But in fact, they are taking advantage of uh, the shuttle bus and use it as a labor management regime because uh, many of those uh, migrant workers, they are living uh, very far away from the factories in order to make sure they can uh, go to work on time, especially during some extreme weather. So providing free shuttle bus at a very low cost, in fact, is very effective in controlling uh, or managing uh, the labor uh, to uh, ensure their productivity. So uh, they are very cleverly uh, using this informal institution to uh, manage their labor and also to consolidate uh, the housing provision within uh, the resettlement enclaves uh, because uh, some of those factories actually require their employees to live in one of those uh, resettlement housing where uh, the uh, free shuttle passes uh, can uh, stop by, can provide the services, or uh, they would uh, pro 
prioritize uh, the jobs to uh, those workers who already have accommodation in those places, or they will require the workers to change the accommodation to certain uh, resettlement enclaves in order to better manage uh, the labor. So this is uh, why I said that uh, the, reset, uh, the shuttle bus services actually play a very important role in uh, the housing um, choices for uh, the migrant workers. So in that sense, uh, the informal services of free shuttle buses uh, actually uh, linking uh, the housing choices uh, with uh, the employment choices for migrant workers. And this has, um, to some extent, constrained the mobility for the migrant workers uh, because they have very limited choices for housing. And if they want to secure their job in certain uh, companies, they have to follow the instruction of the employers by moving to uh, the housing estates which have this uh, free shuttle bus services, all right? So compared with uh, other migrants in uh, Chinese cities who are free to choose their accommodation, but of course they, 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 can, they also have limited choice because of their low affordability, but uh, at least they have a wider choices in terms of housing. So in SIP, uh, this nested enclave um, arrangement for migrants, in fact, has uh, further limited uh, their physical mobility and also enhance uh, their uh, precarity because they can be easily uh, managed and also be driven away. Uh, be, some even have been evicted because of uh, the stringent regulation imposed by uh, the local state if they discover that um, the subdivided housing has accommodated too many people in one single uh, residential unit. Uh, sometimes they could enforce very uh, stringent regulation to evict uh, some of uh, those migrant uh, workers. So this is a diagram showing, uh, to, to summarize um, the hybrid housing regime in SIP as well as uh, the spatial arrangement uh, for the nested migrant enclaves, uh, which I will not go into the details uh, because I, I have already explained. So next, I will quickly move to the second story I would like to share with you uh, uh, together with my colleagues uh, in Cambridge University. We recently um, conducted a research on a gated community in Beijing and to observe the changing housing prices and uh, people's perceptions for uh, living in gated communities uh, during the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. So in Beijing, there are two major waves of uh, COVID-19 outbreak. One is around uh, January when um, the Chinese New Year was uh, approaching. Uh, in February. And the second wave was in uh, June. So um, the, this uh, figure on the right is comparing the intra-city mobility or internal travel within Beijing uh, in, 20, in, in this year uh, compared with last year. So you can see uh, there is a very uh, obvious uh, reduced um, internal or intra-city uh, traveling in intercity mobility this year because of uh, the outbreak. And uh, I would also like to mention that um, the Beijing government actually introduced very different uh, pandemic control policies during the two waves. During the first wave, um, the entire country actually in a lockdown mode. Uh, so people do not uh, move at all. Most of them stay at home or at least uh, stay within their uh, residential neighborhood. But in the second wave, people already resumed their uh, normal life. Uh, but uh, because of uh, the second outbreak, uh, the, the Beijing government also tend to introduce uh, some uh, control, uh, pandemic control measures by restricting um, people's access to residential neighborhood. Basically, uh, the neighborhood scale uh, pandemic control measures uh, was, uh, has been introduced in the second wave. This has um, created um, 
very profound impact in people's uh, perception of uh, enclave living. So this is uh, the data uh, we obtain uh, through um, uh, online transaction, uh, housing transaction data provided by one of the largest um, real estate uh, agent in China called Lianjia. And also we make use of the high resolution uh, aerial imagery and the uh, open, uh, open access map to identify the gated community in Beijing. And we further uh, categorize the gated community into three types. One is based on the, the level of gatedness. So uh, for the low uh, gated degree, uh, we are referring to those gated communities uh, having the physical walls or gates, but do not have very stringent access control. Uh, but for uh, level two and level three, we are referring to gated community, which not only have gates, walls, but also have uh, more stringent access control, especially pedestrian uh, control uh, through either through smart car or through um, security guard patrol and so on and so forth. So uh, based on that, we uh, ran uh, the difference in difference um, hedonic model for um, different types of uh, gated community uh, having controlling the physical property features uh, as well as um, the district uh, fixed effect and uh, year and month fixed effect. So after controlling or other possible um, factors influencing housing price, we discovered that uh, the level of gatedness actually have a very significant impact on housing price, especially during the second wave. So uh, the degree of uh, gatedness also have seen a uh, very um, significant impact in enhancing the housing premium uh, for uh, gated communities. Uh, in other words, uh, people are willing to pay a much higher prices for living in a uh, gated community with more stringent access control compared to the normal time. Uh, because we, we do know that uh, gated community tend to have a higher housing price compared to open access neighborhood. But uh, this housing premium even increased at a much um, uh, obvious um, degree after the outbreak, especially during the second wave. So other than uh, the housing price, we also observe uh, the rising number of uh, visitors or viewers who are interested in uh, housing units within the gated community. So a similar finding has been uh, discovered uh, in terms of uh, the level of gatedness as, as well as um, uh, the timing in the second wave, uh, the increase in number of viewers has uh, significantly increased. Uh, the third model uh, we developed is to compare the discount price uh, from uh, the asking price, the actual transaction price compared with the asking price. We discovered that um, the level of gatedness has reduced uh, the discount rate, which means uh, people have to pay more uh, to uh, purchase um, housing in a gated community with uh, children control. So um, finally, uh, there is a, a triple difference analysis uh, by adding in another uh, effect, which is uh, the size of housing estates. So before the uh, pandemic, uh, during the normal time, usually a larger gated community uh, tend to have a positive impact on the housing price because um, the larger gated community tend to provide better services, right? They can have a better clubhouse, they can provide uh, better uh, green uh, greenery services and also can uh, some can even provide um, schools inside a gated community. So people tend to uh, consider living in a bigger gated community having more positive effects. So they're paying more uh, to living in a bigger gated community. But things have uh, changed quite uh, dramatically after the outbreak. 
because uh, smaller gated community tend to have uh, more effective control for excluding outsiders. So people quickly perceive uh, this effect and uh, they tend to um, bid for a higher price to living in a uh, smaller gated community, which can provide better security uh, for them during the pandemic. So this is uh, another uh, findings that we discovered. So to quickly summarize, um, from this study, we can see that um, the residents are willing to pay more uh, compared to the normal time to live in a more rigorously controlled gated community because um, they can perceive a higher degree of security uh, living in such a, a residential setting. But this will uh, send a strong and possibly misleading signal to real estate developers because in order to capture the higher housing premium, they will tend to enhance the, the access control to enhance the giddiness uh, for, um, uh, for housing development. And this will uh, definitely will uh, exacerbate uh, segregation and inequality in terms of um, housing development and uh, urban uh, social life. And uh, um, although um, this is a, a very um, um, temporary phenomenon that we observe uh, during the outbreak, but we can also foresee that uh, this will create a lasting effect uh, in the coming years, because uh, we don't know uh, how the pandemic is going to develop uh, before more effective vaccine has been invented and more, um, more widely uh, applied. So uh, the top leadership in China actually already announced or predict that uh, the community level, residential community level pandemic control will be regularized which means uh, the security zone effect for KD community will be long lasting. So this will uh, create a, a long-term effect in affecting housing prices and also affecting the physical form as well as uh, access control and uh, daily management in KD community. So uh, we can expect that um, greater segregation or exclusion could be uh, predicted in the uh, near future. So uh, on the other hand, this uh, elevated housing prices uh, will uh, again worsening uh, the housing affordability and inequality uh, as well. In a city like Beijing, uh, it's already uh, very unfriendly to uh, migrant workers and outsiders. Uh, with this recent development, we can predict that some social groups, especially uh, the more vulnerable and disadvantaged groups like uh, rural to urban migrants, they would be further excluded and marginalized and even completely evicted uh, from uh, Beijing and some other first tier cities, which is uh, worrying for, uh, from a planning and, um, and uh, management uh, pers governance perspective. So taking together these two stories, and uh, I, I tend to um, emphasize a more dynamic view of the evolving enclave urbanism in China and in other contexts uh, along both the spatial and temporal dimensions to discover some new mechanism and new forms of enclaves uh, that are evolving over time and across different uh, spaces. And also I foreground uh, the importance of uh, both uh, structural or institutional factors, including formal and informal institutions as well as some unexpected exogenous uh, forces like uh, the coordinating the public uh, health uh, emergence. So in the first story, we can see that the informal institutions, especially uh, the free bus, uh, shuttle bus uh, services actually consolidating uh, the unequal power, power relation and neoliberal and as well as productivist regime imposed by the state as well as the transnational companies. These have uh, together have led to a aggravated marginality and disadvantages uh, for the migrants. And in the second story, uh, we can see that COVID-19 as an ex unexpected exogenous um, forces has uh, brought uh, very significant and profound uh, changes to people's uh, perception of gated community and enclave living, uh, which might have a uh, 
a very profound social economic implication uh, lasting in the coming years as well. So I will uh, stop here. I think my time is almost up and I welcome any uh, comments and questions and, and welcome to visit our lab uh, through the website and also uh, please follow us on Twitter and also on WeChat. Thank you. So um, over to you, uh, Ruth and Grace. Thank you, Xinjing. That was wonderful. Um, so uh, I want to open up the floor for questions. I think uh, uh, we could probably entertain a question if you want to jump in and, and mute yourself and ask, go ahead. Uh, you can also, if you feel shy, uh, want to uh, write it on the, on the chat box. We can also kind of uh, mediate the question if you prefer, but in general, uh, feel free to jump in. And since I don't see a question just yet, I just have a question as, as you were talking, Xinjing. I was surprised by, um, uh, you know, from the point of view of, uh, of urban planning, public planning, uh, it seems that from, from what you were telling us that there's a certain proliferation and, and hardening of these uh, enclaves, right? And, uh, and sort of privatized parts of cities. And I'm surprised that, uh, has there been a pushback from the point of view of, of public planning in terms of not allowing that, or in fact, encouraging that seems to be what you were saying. So what's uh, different cities doing different things or um, how did this happen? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, at the national level, actually the government is uh, implicitly encouraging the development of uh, gated community. Yeah, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's more efficient in terms of housing provision and also uh, it reduced uh, the responsibility for uh, the government, especially concerning public security, because in each gated community, they will hire their um, security guard to um, safeguard the security and privacy for the homeowners. So, um, so the government actually encouraging, uh, but you are right that there are some pushback uh, from um, the uh, from the civil society or from. Uh, scholars and planners uh, do um, in 2016, the end of uh, 16, uh, the central government actually uh, announced a plan to open up the gates for gated communities, especially those uh, mega uh, gated community, which can accommodate more than 10,000 people, right? So you, you oh. rally you rarely see such um, large scale getting me in the US, I guess. But it's not uncommon in uh, cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. And this has created a problem not only in terms of uh, social segregation, inequality, but also um, they are blocking the traffic and creating huge problems for. Um, uh, traffic congestion, especially like a uh, city in Beijing, uh, very busy traffic uh, during the peak time. And and those um, large scale gated community, they are occupying a very large piece of land and uh, the public streets and roads cannot go through, cannot cut cutting across those gated communities. So, Basically, uh, this is the biggest problem conceived, uh, perceived by the government. So they're trying to um, discourage the development of large-scale gated community. But uh, again, this has this policy soon after its announcement, it has been um, um, induced uh, heated debates among the public. So many homeowners actually are against this idea because uh, it will reduce their property value for them if uh, they open up and they cannot uh, enjoy the exclusive uh, services anymore, although they have uh, paid for it uh, when they purchase the housing. And uh, another uh, resistance also coming from a local government because uh, this gated community can generate a lot of income for the government, as we can imagine, by selling the land. Uh, another uh, resistance uh, coming from the concern of um, uh, the worsening of public security, right? It will impose a huge um, 
responsibility and cost for the government to to uh, provide uh, more services for public security and also for uh, garbage collection, everything that you can imagine that uh, has been taken uh, taken up by uh, the property management company uh, nowadays uh, within the gated community. So basically, um, it's there are a lot of resistance uh, and, and a lot of debates so uh, this policy did not really eventually uh, come through because of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are ongoing debates, yeah. So we have a couple of questions in the box. I don't know if you guys want to jump in. Uh, Shu Fei Ren, maybe, do you want to jump in and ask your question? If not, I'll ask it, but just give it a second. Hi, hello, everybody, can you hear me? A little louder, please. Hi. Hi, Shafei. Go ahead. Oh, hi, hi. Hi, Shenjing. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. I have uh, just a very uh, simple empirical question. Can you give us a sense of who are the people buying property um, during the pandemic, either in the first wave or the second wave? Um, thank you for your question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that because uh, as I mentioned, the data is coming from a online listing agent. So um, obviously they cannot provide um, the socioeconomic status for the home buyers. So, so this is, um, restricted uh, data, which we don't have the access to the profile for the home buyers. Uh, so, so I cannot answer your question, but, but this is indeed a very important one. Uh, I am planning to conduct a survey, a questionnaire survey. So hopefully we can link uh, the survey data with uh, the online listing or transaction data to provide answers to your question. But uh, based on my speculation, I think those are the middle class or even upper class or uh, people who are investing in the property market because they, they foresee that um, the, the changing perception of people will, will um, give rise to uh, the skyrocketing housing price in those uh, gated communities, especially uh, the high level of uh, gatedness. So they try to invest in uh, those property or uh, they could be the people who are the first time home buyers who are looking to looking forward to settle down in Beijing and they are comparing different types of um, housing uh, essays and they might prefer to live in a more secure and um, and uh, rigorously control uh, communities that can provide uh, more um, safety uh, during the pandemic for them. Yeah, but, but uh, really, I don't have the exact answer for your question. It's purely speculation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, we have another question from Alejandro Saldana Perales. Alejandro, you want to jump in? Give you a minute. Uh, sure thing. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, um, right now I'm on, uh, as you can see, on uh, daddy duty, <laughs> and um, uh, well, my question was mostly regarding the this, uh, and I don't know if it is right to use the term abuse, but the patterns of abuse that you have described uh, in between or you know, in conjunction within state and employer towards the migrating uh, communities, they resemble to me this uh, situation which it's mostly focused towards rural migrants. I was wondering if these were to be migrants from other Chinese cities, already urbanized citizens with these patterns of abuse maintain? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the good question. 
Um, perhaps I should add that um, in China, there is a huge disparity between rural and urban. So that's why I emphasized uh, rural to urban my migrants. Uh, for the migrants from other cities or the so-called urban migrants, they tend to have a much better uh, socioeconomic status. Like uh, the first social group I show in one of the slides, they already obtained the local uh, citizenship. Uh, let's put it this way. So the hukou in Chinese uh, cities is uh, equal to equals to uh, citizenship. So for those urban migrants, it's easier for them to obtain the local citizenship. So uh, they have uh, better access to housing, education, healthcare, and uh, everything else. So for the rural migrants, they tend to be in a more uh, disadvantaged um, position. That's why um, in that article, we, we uh, emphasize on uh, the housing uh, choice for the rural migrants. So, um, so I am not familiar with uh, the pattern of abuse uh, from uh, the state or from the employer happening in, uh, in the US, but I assume uh, that this unequal power relation uh, can also be observed in other social groups, uh, not only migrants, uh, for instance, the, the manual workers or low skill workers, they are, they are already in a very disadvantaged uh, position. So in order to survive or make a living in a place that they have a limited citizenship, it's, it's inevitably, um, they could be abused uh, by the local government or by the employer, uh, similar to the phenomenon I described uh, in my research. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank, Thank you, Alejandro, you. also. So I think last question, given the time, uh, and I think it's from uh, Ji Yan Yang, and I think uh, uh, they cannot uh, unmute themselves. So I'm just gonna ask you. Uh, the question is about, can you give us a um, sense of the percentage of how many urban housing in China is in a gated community by some definition? Oh, okay. And what are the alternatives? Yeah, uh, uh, as I said that uh, almost, um, 80% of uh, the newly developed housing uh, can be categorized as gated community, but uh, there are some older housing estates as well. So some are uh, the so-called work unit camper uh, developed by state-owned enterprises during the 1960s until 1980s. So those are actually gated, right? Gated residential community, but they are very different from uh, the gated community originated from the North America. But uh, after the market reform, those, even those um, state-owned enterprises, residential compound has been privatized, which means uh, the both the physical form as well as uh, the daily management are actually converging to uh, the commercial uh, commercially developed uh, gated community. So in that sense, uh, if you could uh, consider them as an alternative form of gated community. So in that sense, I would say, um, I don't know the exact uh, percentage, uh, but I would say that uh, over 60 or even 70% of um, the residential uh, ECs uh, would, can be categorized as gated community. And for the migrant enclaves, which is a third type of residential enclave, um, they are not gated, uh, they are open access. But uh, as I said, they can also consider as enclaves because they are socially and also institutionally segregated uh, from uh, the rest of the city. That's why I also consider them as uh, uh, residential enclaves, although they don't really have the physical boundaries or gates, walls. It's also, yeah. So a lot of enclaving. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Shen Jing. Uh, so uh, it's been a pleasure to see you again and to be able to me communicate. Too, we too. really appreciate you jumping in, you know, at this time of, of night for you. And uh, I just want to tell everybody to uh, uh, also thank Shen Jing, but also keep an eye on her work, which is really exciting. She does all kinds of different things. 
uh, she gave you a perspective today on, on enclaves, but she's really doing very uh, amazingly creative work using a variety of sources. You mentioned, for example, online listings for housing, uh, but also all kinds of mobility data as well as surveys and qualitative methods. So it's, it's really wonderful work, Shinjing. Thank you for sharing it Thank with you. us. Keep an eye on her lab and a Hong Kong University, right? Lots of things happening there that are also very interesting. Yes, yes, we are recruiting. So if you are interested in working with us, uh, please, uh, please, uh, um, yeah, uh, check out our website. And I can also share the link with uh, Luis, and then he can circulate among you. And and thank you again for having me. And it's really a great pleasure. And thank good you. to see you all yeah. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.